I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little different approach because there were so many people that dedicated so much of their time over about a four year period uh, that I really put together a presentation more um, not so much in, in, in all about the numbers, but more about the people uh, that came out to volunteer. We kicked their butt. It was just an awesome experience. Everybody's still talking about it all over the county and even across the bay. Uh, and that's how No Tax for Tracks defeated Greenlight Pinellas just about a year ago this week. And the stage for this is the Tampa Bay area in Florida. And, and it's really takes in Hillsborough County, which was over here, and Pinellas County. So I know a lot of you are familiar with these areas. I live, for instance, right here in St. Petersburg. And then here's Clearwater. This is all Pinellas County, a million people, 24 cities. And over here we have Hillsborough uh, with, I believe, three cities and um, uh, a bigger population. What is it, Mark? 1.3. Yeah, 1.3 million. So the combined area here is a, a little over $2 million. So what we have is a rail cartel who, of course, want to have rail all over the area. Uh, and so they ran into um, part uh, of our uh, opposition in 2010, and, uh, that, and that's what we're going to start talking about. But we have what I call the sinister plot. And I love that Vince has put together uh, through his observations, what we've certainly all put together, which is the network of uh, people that have managed to infiltrate our entire political system and to uh, uh, undermine the will of the people and just to move forward their own sinister plots. And uh, basically, uh, the regional light rail in March of 2010 in Tampa, the Tampa Bay corporate membership group called Tampa Bay Partnership under the banner moving Hillsborough forward, were pressed, they pressed the Tampa politicians for action uh, on light rail over there in Hillsborough County. And the Hillsborough County Commission obliged and placed a 1% sales tax on the referendum for November of 2010. And uh, a local activist, Sharon Calvert, who you all know that's here today, and her husband, Mark, and Karen Jarosz, you might remember Karen from prior meetings, and, and their group over in Hillsborough County um, they worked so hard uh, that year, and they defeated um, the uh, moving, Hills, moving Hillsborough forward in 2010. And I'll never forget, because Karen and I and Sharon were all good friends, uh, through the Tea Party movement, and Karen called me as soon as that election was over. I wasn't even on my radar screen, other than I knew that's what they were working on. And she says, I hate to tell you this, but they're having a meeting next month over in Pinellas County for light rail. And I said, what? I, I don't care. I don't want to hear about it. I said, that's not, that's not anything I'm really interested in. And I said, but we'll go to the meeting. <laughs> oh, those were the worst words. Uh, <laughs> so I got two or three or I don't know, four or five of us, and we went to that meeting that day at the collaborative lab at St. Pete College. How much trouble is that? And, uh, you know, that, 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 that was the earmarks of the problems. And they had... Um, uh, by the way, I wanted to just show you here that over in Hillsboro, the PACs were formed by both sides. Uh, the rail cartel, I call them, raised 1.7 million. This is over in Tampa, Hillsboro. And that was made up of things like Holland and Knight, um, legal law firm, 25,000. You can see the size of the donations of the Tampa Bay Partnership memberships. SunTrust, 50,000. Sykes, 50,000. Tampa Electric, 40,000. And the grassroots, Karen and Sharon, raised $24,000, and they beat them. Uh, and so moving Hillsborough forward was defeated, and the final vote was 58 to 41%. Uh, and then, as I say, one month later, uh, they have the meeting over in uh, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and 25 hand-picked biz big business Tampa Bay Partnership members, along with rail-friendly elected officials, met uh, uh, to press on for the rail, and several of us were there. And on December the 10th, just about uh, a month, uh, I mean a year later, the um, Pinellas County Commission put it on the referendum. And so that was our county. So then we had a year of a fight ahead of us. We did everything we could to try to keep that from going on the referendum. We tried to make life really miserable for them, including suing the county commission. And uh, uh, we couldn't get it stopped. And so in Pinellas County, we had no money and a year plus fight in front of us. And the cast 
Those supporting Greenlight was the Tampa Bay Partnership that had come out of Hillsboro, such as the Rays, the Bucks, Sykes Enterprises, Duke Energy, Baycare, Raymond James, Jable, county governments, and all donating money. And then the Yes for Greenlight crowd, which was the PAC, receiving the donations, hiring the operatives, executing the campaign to pass the referendum. Connect Tampa Bay was another group that popped up, which I called the Young Turks, that were hired by Tampa Bay Partnership to skirmish with the grassroots at the street level. And they would, whenever like we would have speaking engagements, they would send occupiers uh, to, to come and be hecklers in the crowd. Uh, Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority were, of course, in support, which was the local transit agency with CEO Brad Miller. Six out of seven of the Pinellas County commissioners were in support, four of whom serve on the PSTA board. If that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what is, uh, that they have, you know, two votes uh, or four or six, depending on how many committees they're on. Uh, 24 mostly greenlight friendly city councils in Pinellas County. And numerous Pinellas Chambers of Commerce, the St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Palm Harbor, Dunedin, the Beaches, the Chamber, Tampa Chambers, all against us, uh, the Tampa Bay Times, the Tampa Tribune, other local newspapers, and the Sierra Club. So this was kind of a lineup of the, the folks that were on that side, and here's us. <laughs> I love this picture. Uh, this was at a, uh, at a, a Fourth of July parade. And if we're not a ragtag group, I don't know. And what you're looking at here, and there's other people, of course. This was just the folks that showed up that day for the, uh, for the parade. But we have a fantastic crew of people that were uh, all kinds of marketing backgrounds, uh, engineers, uh, internet gurus, uh, uh, television producers, uh, videographers. I mean, every talent you could think of. But no tax for tracks, uh, myself, and our videographer, Sully Grasso, we attended and taped over 300 PSTA meetings over three years. And we did not miss a meeting, a committee meeting. From that day at the college, we, we, we started kind of going to the meetings. And then, I mean, Sully at this moment is up to five cameras at a PSTA meeting. He has them set at all of, these people hate us. And so we're up to now 500 videos, but at the time of the, ele of the election, I mean, we continue to, even though it's been over now for a year, we're still on them because, of course, they're zombies and uh, they're trying to come back. But going to the meetings was how we gathered the information. And, and uh, when I would come back, I would get their slideshow off of uh, online, and then I would incorporate the most dar damning parts of their slide into my presentation to show the public what we, had, uh, what we had found out about the facts about it. So we formed the No Tax for Track Strategy Committee. This is my office, and every Thursday night, we had meetings for 15 months. We hardly missed a single Thursday night. Sometimes 30 people would show up, sometimes seven people would show up. But we continued to move forward, and we set up a 501c4 and a political committee uh, called No Tax for Tracks. We uh, immediately hired a top political legal firm in Tallahassee uh, to protect us. And we hired the top political accounting firm, the top political accounting firm arguably in the country, who happens to be over in Tampa, before they had a chance to get them. So we were, we were, we were uh, very strategic in that. And we filed our papers on December the 31st. And then we had our campaign kickoff meeting in January at a local church. Isn't that beautiful? We had a fantastic turnout. Uh, the, the Tribune did a story on it trying to belittle us, and it turned out driving people to our meeting. And so we really were very appreciative of that, that, uh, that story. And this was a, uh, this was a great, we, have, we had uh, 225 debates and presentations that were completed starting with this kickoff meeting. And uh, we set up a tone, uh, phone team to book seminars, and we had about four people on our phone team and uh, they just were calling, calling, calling. Now, we were able through uh, the PSTA website to see where they were going to be. Finally, they quit taking off where they were going to be because we would just call those people and say, well, why don't you want to hear both sides? And they would end up booking us, too. Well, they, did, they got kind of tired of that. Um, so this right here, for instance, is the Pinellas Park Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, um, you know, I could go on. Every one of these is a story. Uh, 
we, I created a, my, my background is in presentations, and so I created a hard-hitting presentation with all of their information, you understand, and we had a five-minute version, a 10-minute version, 15 and 20, and focused on busting the lies that they were out perpetuating. So every time, you know, they had their messaging and we had the, we had the truths backed up by their slides and we, uh, that we had collected at the meeting and presented. And some of these presentations were actual debates. Uh, and sometimes I, there was one meeting in particular that it was set up by a, a group out of Tampa and it was over in St. Pete and it was four to one, uh, four men and me. Uh, and I was sitting there with a whole stack of papers on my, on my lap. We had no table. Uh, I mean, and it was sponsored by the St. Pete Times too. And they tried their darndest to get us but I just, you know, I just stayed on the mountain. I called it the mountain. The mountain was the talking point. So whenever I'd get out into the shark infested waters, I'd swim back to the mountain uh, on the island and try to, and that really was a very good way to keep out of trouble was to stay on the mountain. So uh, I, we formed a speaker team uh, and everyone had a thumb drive of the CAN presentation so that if, uh, if we needed to, uh, if somebody couldn't make it, somebody else maybe could. The canned presentation is what kept us on message and to always hit the main talking points. For instance, that 8% that they were trying to pass were 7% sales tax in Pinellas County would have made us the highest sales tax in the state of Florida. People don't want to be known as having the highest sales tax in the state of Florida. And that was the, that was the number one message that resonated with the voters was the highest sales tax. Um, this is another message, and I'm sure you all uh, here can, reson can uh, this resonates with you too. But here they were saying about how they had record ridership, record ridership, that they needed rail. And I would simply say, have you noticed the empty buses? And th that, that just killed them. They hated this. And, and this is where they finally got the hecklers to come, and they'd be sitting over here, and they'd go, no, we didn't notice the empty buses. Well, everybody else in the room had noticed the empty buses because they're running all over town. To this day, empty buses are running all over town. And so the question became then, let's see here, what happened? There we go. This is where I would bring out a PSTA slide and I would show them that this is on PSTA PowerPoint and that this would show them this is why there are empty buses. And this is the route that was done by the independent bus study that they had to do. And the independent bus study showed them that there were 40 routes and that out of their entire 40 route system, the gray is the buses, the blue are the, um, uh, the trolley cars, and that this is, this is untouched, ladies and gentlemen. This is what I would always tell them. The top five local routes account for 46% of the system ridership, and the PST trolley over here counts for just these two, count for another 13. So out of all the 40 routes, all the investments, all the drivers, all of the infrastructure involved, that only seven routes accounted for 60% of the system. This is why we see empty buses. This is why we see empty, oh, they hated this. They, you know, this was, this was terrible. Then I would show also the PSTA spending uh, and how, you know, how their spending from 2002 had just skyrocketed and just continued to go over the years. Now here's where we had the recession and you can see they kind of slowed down but then they had a 30% tax hike on the ad valorem. And what happened, ladies and gentlemen? It just took off again. And this is where they have the referendum for November. And they think that you're going to pass a one, penny, one penny sales tax. And they're going to continue to uh, escalate their spending. Uh, and again, this is PSTA's own slide. Oh, thank you. So another one is just the scope of the tax increase to show people what the existing revenue was to PSTA and what it would be with the sales tax. You know, this, this just could not be, uh, so I, you know, this information was taken to the public, all of these facts. This was Greenlight's logo. This is our version of Greenlight's logo. This of course is our darling. And we had collateral, all kinds of uh, bumper stickers. Uh, we had um, uh, signs, magnetic signs. We went door to door every single Sunday uh, and, um, to get permission and we would only go on the main streets throughout the county we would meet in a different part of the county and we would go to every house and almost you know sometimes there'd be three and four houses in a row that would say sure put a sign out sure put a sign out 
and, and it was all, all the main drags. Everybody thought that our signs were everywhere, and they were. Uh, and, the, and we also then had put .com on our yard sign so people would go to our website, and there they could order a sign too. And we had on there a 24-hour pizza offer, more or less, where if you know, order the sign, and we guarantee we'll have it to your house within 24 hours. And we did. And that ended up being a total nightmare for me because all of the requests went into my inbox. And you can see that at one point in October, it went completely viral. And this is my inbox. And you can see sign request, sign request, sign request, sign request, sign request. And the worst part for me was trying to figure out how to get the signs all over the entire county. So I, you know, without belaboring it, I set up 24 sign teams and we painted the, painted the county red with 7,000 of our yard signs. We had 24 sign team members in the communities delivered signs within 24 hours. I had depots. I had about four depots around the county of people's houses, and then people could go to those depots and get the signs. Billboards were all over. We had Pete Franco uh, was our billboards. Uh, we had fundraisers. Um, we entered parades. Uh, we had a flea market. Uh, this gentleman here donated $50,000 to our campaign, and he stood at a flea market every weekend for a year. We had gun show booths, college expo days, four senior expos around the county, which a friend of mine owned this company, and she gave us a tremendous deal to be in all the big senior expos, which, by the way, we had what always, the seniors always love which was the roulette wheel. <laughs> and they could get a bumper sticker. We had Randall O'Toole that came and helped us. Uh, and, and also, this gentleman here is Daryl McQuarrie, who wrote a song called Nose Tracks for Tracks. He was uh, out of Nashville. Here's where Randall did a speaking engagement, and their side speaker qu canceled that afternoon and didn't show up. They had to get another speaker. We had a uh, press conference where all of the media came. And our press, uh, the, the presser, which was at my office, was to tell them we had, a, had our first poll and that we were ahead 46 to 38. We had social media, Facebook, Google, interactive websites with sign requests. Uh, we had a dynamic Facebook page with uh, 4,400 likes, legitimate likes, and we smoked them on Facebook to the point they run th in, the, in the newspaper complaining that we were had an undue advantage on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> Tom Rask helped very much with the Facebook page. Can you just go back one, one Wait a minute, I don't, I'm out of time. I'm running out of time. Facebook, major points, we'll have well, Q&A though. Major points tying into our, I, this is Facebook. So you see this looks like, this is our major talking points that look like our yard sign. We had cartoons on our Facebook page. This we called the PSTA gravy train all the fat cats, and we put the names of the countries, companies that had donated to, uh, right on Facebook, they hated that. A devastating email, Tom uh, is a master at emails. We gathered 125,000 email addresses through public records requests. It was a brilliant idea of Tom's, and we sent out emails with my picture on it, uh, just hitting them right between the eyes, over and over. We were on the radio. We had six automated robocalls, uh, that I, I did. Pat Boone made a robocall to all the seniors in the county because I know people at 60 plus and we called and, and Pat Boone did it for us. Um, let's see, popular, we did street sign waving three evenings a week all year without fail and people w would show 30, 25, 30 people and, and uh, some people would honk and wave, there's a give us a finger. <laughs> All ages love to come and sign wave at the street corners. And then we had, be, uh, Eileen gave me the idea to, to do this, which um, we, uh, the Saturday before the election, we put together a bus. We went all over the county with a bus tour and did train crossing here at the intersections and said, you know, train every 15, every five minutes. People hated that. And uh, we had a boat. One of our members has got a 42 foot sailboat. And, this was, I called the SS Green Light. I mean, the SS No Tax for Tracks. And one side was our sign, and on this side was the Green Light sign. And you could see the people. I mean, I rode on the bus, I mean, on this boat one, one, one weekend, one Saturday. And as we're going from St. Pete Beach all the way up, people started going, No Tax for Tracks. <laughs> and they were doing it all the way up the beach. <laughs> September 12th, the t I'm almost done, Butch. September 12th. 
uh, the Tampa Tribune embraces, he te they, they tell everybody in their editorial that voters should embrace green light panels. Now, by this point, I mean, there's so much that has happened and they, that we are just so kicking their butts. And so the Tribune comes out and tries to help out of the Tampa Hillsborough side and telling people that voters over in, in Pinellas, they should embrace that green light Pinellas. And that was on September 12th. And on October 3rd, the Tampa Bay Times recommended voting yes on green light Pinellas. And what was the final vote outcome? Greenlight, they raised two million, over, really over two million dollars. This is the Chamber of Commerce president who became the chair of the Greenlight campaign. Uh, this is election night. He's not very happy to find out that they're lo they just lost. And here we ended up raising ninety-seven thousand dollars, and we won sixty-two to thirty-eight. This is a picture of the county that shows the blue is who supported it which is South St. Pete and the entire rest of the county. Actually, they didn't get a single municipality uh, and it was 62 to 38 that we won. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I took too long.